Hi, this is Patrick Scott. Welcome back to PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. We're going to today talk, uh, wrap up our discussion about political parties and their influence and how they've changed. And particularly what I want to focus on today is to um, help you understand why we have a two-party system as opposed to what we were talking about before, a multi-party system, and how that affects the outcome of elections here. So we talk about that. Uh, after we discuss some of those issues, we'll talk about a little bit uh, about the role of parties and political parties in Missouri as well. And we might even dip into a little bit in terms of discussion about campaigns and elections uh, as part of this segment too. But um, when, we've, when we were talking last time, we, were, we, we had mentioned the idea that um, uh, the different party periods that we have in our history, and we were talking about the idea of party alignments and party realignments and so forth. One of the things I also wanted to point out is that each of those periods that we, we were talking about was marked by something called a, a, um, a, new, a new realignment is marked by something called a critical election. So for example, 1932 was considered a critical election. Some texts call that a realigning election, but I also want to point that out, is that a critical election or realigning election basically marks the beginning of a party realignment. Um, again, when we discussed this uh, during our last segment, we were talking about what have we seen basically since 1968? Has there been a true realignment? Um, that has taken place that has fundamentally altered this New Deal coalition or have uh, other types of tendence, trends uh, basically undercut that argument such as the idea of maybe a split level realignment or even a dealignment. Again, there's some evidence for, for actually those two things as opposed to a true realignment that has taken place since the 1960s. Be interesting to see, again, this is the kind of thing that you don't really know about what's happening until you look, look sort of in the mirror and see what's, what's been going on over time. But it'll be interesting, for example, to see perhaps what's happened, say, beginning in either 2000, maybe 2008 with the election of Barack Obama. Might that be the signal of a new alignment? More, of a, more again, more of the lines of moving toward um, a, uh, a desire among the people for a larger role of government in our, in our life or was this simply maybe a reaction of the policies of the prior administration? It's hard to say at this point, but it'll be interesting to see over time whether political scientists will come to see 2008 or perhaps even 2004, even though it was a re-election of George Bush, as potentially the beginning of a new realignment taking place. It'll be interesting to see that. Okay, so now today we want to talk about the idea of why do we have a two-party system? Um, why don't we have m many parties? And again, as you know, we do have many parties. I mean, we have a, a Green Party, a Libertarian Party, um, a Right to Life Party, we have a Communist Party, a Socialist Party. Um, plenty of parties actually do operate throughout all of the state, local, and federal levels. Uh, there are parties all across our country. But by and large, though, as you know, we are dominated by a two party system. We are a broad based two party system. So the question is, what are the factors that contribute to the maintenance or the reinforcement of a two-party system? And along the same lines, why is it difficult for third parties to do very well, perform very effectively in our system? Well, perhaps one of the most important reasons why we have a two-party system and why we're going to continue to have a two-party system down the road is because of the way we elect our legislat legislators. Here in America, all across um, our country, when we're talking about electing members of Congress, in particular the House of Representatives, all right, we use something called a, sing a winner take all single member district system or a single member district winner take all system. People who are elected to our House of Representatives, and really even in lower levels too, like in Jefferson City, but let's talk about the House of Representatives right now at the national level. People who are elected to the House are elected from single member districts. All right. Now basically what that means is that if you win the district, you win that seat in the House. You don't share that seat with anyone. Each district has only one seat or one position and therefore only one winner. So therefore if you win the majority of votes or at least a plurality, plurality meaning of course the most votes, there may not be a majority, but the most votes. But if you win the majority or pl pl plurality, you win that seat. Uh, again, and, and because of this, this is a winner take all. And because of that, it tends to encourage only two parties to compete. One party wins and one party loses. 
The best way to explain this is by explaining how this contrasts with, again, many Western European democracies. In many countries across the Atlantic, they use what is called a system of proportional representation. We've alluded to this idea, but I want to make sure today that we fully understand what we mean by this. In a system of proportional representation, you have more than one seat assigned to each legislative district. So instead of say having one seat per district, there might be numerous seats per district. All right. So let's just pretend for a moment. There's a particular legislative district in, say, France. And in that district, it has 10 seats up for grabs, all right? Now, you have different parties over there, and let's say that the Labor Party gets 40% of the vote in that district. Well, if the Labor Party gets 40% of the vote in that district, they get four of the 10 seats, all right? Another party may get 10% of the vote, and it gets one seat. Another party gets 20% of the vote and gets two seats. So I'm, I'm making this pretty simple here. But essentially then, the citizens will vote for all 10 seats, candidates for all 10 seats, and the party with the most votes gets the greatest proportion of seats. So, in a proportional representation system, what's very interesting about this is that you don't have to win a, a plurality, you know, as a minimum, a plurality to get representation in the legislature. Even less, you don't have to worry about winning a majority. All right? Even if a party won 5% of the, the, the vote in that district, that party would get 5% of the seats, all right? So therefore, because of that, even the smallest parties have a chance to win something, all right? The way the rules of the game are constructed over there guarantees that even minor parties are guaranteed representation. They have a very low threshold to cross in order to get representation in the legislature. So many third and fourth and fifth and sixth parties will form and they run candidates. And you remember in our discussion last time about parties and, and the idea of the nature of ideology, the parties over there, because they're automatically guaranteed representation, they're guaranteed some success or some win, they don't have to worry as much about trading off their beliefs to gain more votes. They're perfectly willing and content to maintain the purity of their belief system in terms of their platform, in terms of they want to advocate in government and society, uh, even if it means not getting as many votes, because as long as they cross a small threshold, they're guaranteed some seats in that legislature. So, because of that, uh, even the smallest parties may have some chance of winning. And again, that tends that kind of system, as you might ex expect, would encourage the formation of many parties. It encourages the, 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 the tendency to remain ideological. And again, and, 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 and people have a very strong attachment to parties uh, it, uh, over there. So again, in many European countries, you have a strong party system where the parties are small, ideological, and they're strong in terms of having an influence over the voter. And the voters are very attached to the parties that they belong to. Uh, and even the smallest parties are guaranteed some, some uh, representation there. There are chances, if you are a voter living in that particular district, that you may not even be familiar with the candidates that are running for office. Or there may be, in fact, some, let's say even in this case here, there could be an example where one party does amazingly well. Let's say that Labor Party in that particular district ended up getting 70% of the votes. Uh, did they have, ten, but even though there are, there are 10 seats in that district, that might suggest they've got 10 candidates, and seven of those candidates would, would, would be going to the legislature, the national legislature. But let's say, for example, the Labor Party only had two candidates running in that district. All right, so here we have two candidates, that, that, but, but yet the Labor Party, you're voting on the basis of party as much, as much as you are candidates. And so the Labor Party ends up getting 70% of the votes, but you've only got two candidates. Well, there's five extra seats now available. You've got the two plus the five to make seven. Where do those other five candidates come from? Well, in, in a system like that, sometimes the candidates will be actually chosen by the national leaders of that party, the national party leaders. Remember, we talked about over there in our last segment about having a centralized system where there's a lot of control at the national level by national leaders that select their own candidates. Well, those particular candidates will end up being selected by their leaders by the national party leaders to serve in that district. So you as a voter may not even know 
really who is representing you. And um, there might be some people who are actually residing in other parts outside of that district, other parts of France, who are now representing you, presumably, in that district. Really, they're representing the party as much as they are representing you, you see. And um, because of that, when we talk about this, for example, when our discussion of Congress, we'll see a very interesting contrast because who are representatives beholden to uh, and how they, how they contrast between our system and their systems. Um, again, as you might suggest, might, might think about this, those five candidates, who are they going to listen to when major votes come up in the legislature? Are those five candidates that you may not have even heard of, are they going to be concerned about how you feel about these particular issues? Or are they going to be listening instead to the party leaders? So again, we'll, again, we'll talk about this later when we talk about Congress, but you'll see a big difference in terms of uh, who basically, quote, controls those, those candidates. Uh, are, are, those, are the members of the legislature, uh, do they, are they beholden to the constituents or are they hold, beholden to the party leaders? In a strong party system like you have over there, those legislators, the people who are serving, are beholden, are, are beholden more to the national party leaders. And they take their cues from the national leadership and vote according to the party line. Okay, so again, chances are you may not even be familiar with the candidates who are running for office, and uh, the, an the candidates that end up getting selected to serve in your district, you may not even know who they are. Now, again, that basically means under a proportional representation system that m the parties are not forced to compromise they can maintain an extreme ideological stance and still be guaranteed some representation in the legislature. Now, compare that again to the United States. Here, in our system, a minor party, a fourth, you know, third, fourth, fifth party, does not stand much of a chance to get any representation. You know, even if they did pretty well and got 20% of the vote in our district, how many people go to, to, to represent us from that district? Zero. So the typical voter will understand this and will not want to, quote, waste his or her vote on a candidate that has no chance of winning. The candidates who have the best chance of winning are within the two dominant parties, the Democrat or Republican. And of course, even here in our country, in, in some districts across our country, um, you know, like for example, the seventh district of Missouri, Democrats have a hard chance of even winning that seat because it's a very strongly conservative Republican district. Um, so if I were your campaign consultant and, and you were going to run for Congress representing the Springfield area and you told me that you were going to be running as a Democrat, I'll say more power to you, but your chances of winning are very, very slim. Um, slim to almost none in some ways because historically the, 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 the nature and the makeup of the voters in the 7th District of Missouri. Um, so even, even then, um, one of the dominant parties nationally, in this case, would not even have much success in some of the districts. Other districts are heavily Democrat, where Republicans have no chance. So it, goes, it works both ways all across our country. But again, as a voter, you're going to much more likely vote for either Democrat or Republican than you are going to be voting for a third party. Because you realize, if you cast your vote for a third party, uh, a libertarian, for example, you know that the chances of that person winning are very small you may be casting your vote anyway because you're more comfortable with that person's political views, that candidate's political views, but uh, it's more of a sim for symbolic purposes more than anything else. It's not going to ensure that they're going to get elected by any means in a single member district winner take all system. Okay, so the fact that we use that type of system, those are the rules of the game that we play here in the United States. That helps to, and I hope you understand this, that helps to guarantee the uh, more likelihood of a winner versus a loser and therefore reinforce the, the dominant two-party system that we have here in place. But beyond that, there are other reasons that have to reinforce that two-party system. As you might imagine, federal and state election laws tend to work against success of third parties. In a lot of ways, they have additional hoops and thresholds to jump through in order to get their candidates on the ballot. It makes it very, very difficult for them. And so sometimes, uh, for example, uh, in order to get on the ballot, that's important in order to obtain funding. But for example, in Missouri, if you are a third party, it's very difficult to get on the ballot in, in like, for example, a presidential election. If you are running as a third party candidate, for example, like what Ross Perot did in 1992, um, you know, you have to get, you can get on the ballot, but you have to do it through petitioning the voters. 
uh, often ranging is from, from 1 to 2 percent of the vote of qualified voters have to sign this petition and it has to be verified before that candidate be, can be, uh, can actually even get placed on the ballot. And so if you think about a state by state um, uh, situation with a third party candidate, having to get on the ballots of all 50 states can be very, very difficult. And again, the, the laws work against their, their success in that regard. Um, another reason why in which, uh, the fa another factor that helps to reinforce a two-party system here in the United States is the fact that, again, try to think about the nature of our two-party system because it is a broad-based two-party system. What do the two parties try to do? They try to appeal to as many voters as possible. Again, the idea of watering down their beliefs to attract more votes. If both parties maintained extreme ideological positions, uh, then a lot of the moderate voters in the middle of our electorate would, would not want to vote for those parties. So they tried to basically reach out to them and in order to reach out to them they've got to basically moderate their ideology, moderate their political platform, their beliefs, their philosophy uh, in order to attract those votes. And that's why we said before in our last segment how in a lot of ways the two parties obviously overlap. And they overlap so much that some people have said, in fact uh, George Wallace, a former third party candidate many years ago, also former governor of Alabama, um, said, and he was, he's a presidential contender uh, of, of, in the 1968 election, uh, he ran as a third party candidate. He said, quote, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the two parties. He's making the arguments that you really can't tell a whole lot of difference between the Democrats and Republicans. I would challenge that assertion by saying, yes, there are certainly distinct differences in terms of what Republicans and Democrats believe, but I also want you to understand the very important point that since both are broad-based coalitions, both uh, 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 try to appeal to that moderate middle range of voters and consequently in a lot of different ways their policy positions, even though there are clear distinctions, there's also a lot of overlap between the two as well in terms of what they believe and what they support. Okay? Now again, you also need to think about the way our society is divided. Um, People in many um, European societies are divided along class lines, religious lines. So some of the different kinds of social divisions and economic divisions cut very, very deep in many European societies. And this prevents them from coming together under coalition governments in the same way as we do, as far as being members of the same party. Here, when people threaten to split off, I mean, here's the, here's the problem that, that, that we have with our two-party system. Uh, and I'll give you, uh, I'll explain this by way of example. Let's say that you are a very solid fiscal conservative. You believe in very, very limited government. You're, you're more libertarian in your orientation than you are uh, conservative, in fact. All right? But you have a conservative streak as well. Um, when you hear, the, so, so you might feel more inclined to join the Republican Party as opposed to the Democratic Party. When you hear the Republican leaders say that we want to have bigger government to help reduce crime. We want to have more programs, build more jails. Uh, we want to have other kinds of programs to help to uh, reduce, uh, to help promote morality in our society. Um, you, you know, you, you see uh, a, a lot of ways that you'll say, well, actually that seems to suggest more bigger government, more defense spending, or other kinds of big government programs that are designed to help reduce crime or protect, enhance morality, whatever it may be. So you begin to hear this as a strong fiscal conservative and saying that's just too much big government. In fact, a lot of fiscal conservatives were very upset with George Bush when he was, George W. Bush when he was president because of the fact that a lot of uh, government, you know, government was very active and, 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 uh, and spent a lot of money and engaged in a lot of deficit spending during his tenure as president. And it really alienated a lot of conservatives. So let's say that you're in that camp of conservatives or libertarians who feel very, very strongly about this and um, you see the Republican leadership saying that we need to spend more money on this and more government programs for this and that, and that pr protect our defense, protect our military. We need to have, uh, maybe we want to expand government surveillance of citizens to help protect us from terrorists, for example. You know, you begin to shy away from that. You begin to say, you know, maybe the Republican Party is not for me. Maybe you see that the Republican leadership is dominated by evangelical conservatives who want to use government say, to promote morality uh, in school, maybe to have more prayer in schools and limit abortions. And you, as a 
maybe a, a, a libertarian may feel like that might be a matter of personal choice and, and you, don't, you just don't believe that government should be active in these kinds of areas. So the point here is you're hearing a lot of viewpoints and issues that are not really reflect by the leadership that's not really reflecting your views. So you say, well, you know what, maybe we need to form our own party. Maybe we need to create our own libertarian party. Maybe we need to elect a candidate. So basically you've got people who are threatening to split off from one of the two major parties, in this case from the Republican Party. Well, when that happens, typically what occurs is that the two parties, or in this case the Republican Party, really takes heed to that and tries to accommodate those positions and those concerns into their own platform and perhaps again try to moderate some of their views uh, to accommodate, you know, people have different viewpoints there. So they try to accommodate the views of minority factions in ways that usually keep them from splitting off into a third party. And that's what, t what tends to happen. Now, what this also tends to reflect is the following. This means that parties often face conflicting pressures. On the one hand, they desire to appeal to a large number of voters who are in the middle, the, the middle of the road voters. They want to appeal to them, but on the other hand, they seek to appeal to the more extremist elements in their party um, and, uh, and trying to tr achieve a balance between the two. Sometimes the true believers, the true conservatives, or the true, the true uh, liberals, you know, those are the ones who are going to go get out on and, and, and pound the pavement and, and go out and knock on doors for you to try to elect candidates for office. These true believers are going to be the, the very ones, the foot soldiers, who are going to be campaigning for you and who are going to be providing a lot of money and support of candidates in your party because they believe in what the party is. And so, on the one hand, you want to appeal to those true believers but at the same time, in doing so, you don't want to be so beholden to them that you end up alienating a lot of voters in the middle. So again, you've got to, that, that's a, a real balancing act that many of the parties and, of course, the candidates representing those parties often have to deal with, all right? especially presidents, too. And we'll talk about that more in terms of campaigns and elections, about the idea and the need to run to the middle once you secure your primary party's nomination. Um, to, to try to appeal to as many voters as possible. Okay, but anyway, the point here I want to suggest to you is why do we have a two-party system and what are the factors that, that lend themselves to the maintenance and the reinforcement of a two-party system? And, and I would think that, you know, again, um, parties here in America, we do have plenty of parties, but they don't stand much of a chance of winning because of these dynamics that are, that are at play in our party system. Um, even historically, the best any party has ever done was when Ross Perot was running for president in 1992 and he garnered 19% of the vote. But it did not translate into him being appointed, obviously, or elected, or you know, he didn't, he didn't win. And no one in his reform party actually got any seats in the legislature. It was not a grassroots party movement. Uh, again, it's hard for third parties to be successful. Sometimes they can, but by and large, it's a very, very limited success and certainly not at the national level. Um, let's move on now and talk a little bit again about making sure that we understand the differences, not only why we have a two-party system, but let's talk about the differences between a two-party, uh, between a strong party system and a weak party system. We'll make sure you understand this again. Again, so let me just give you a definition here. A strong party system is one where parties play a very important if not dominating role in helping to elect candidates and influencing people how to vote. If I were talking to your grandparents way back when, and I would ask them, how many of you out there identify strongly with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, many of them would raise their hands. If, I, if you were in my class and I was asking the same question to you today, how many of you would identify strongly with the, with you, with the, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, far fewer would raise your hands. I would ask how many of you call yourselves independents, many, many more would raise their hands. And again, that's again a reflection of the rise of the independent voter and the accompanying decline of the influence of parties in terms of your vote. So that's why we move toward more from a strong party system, more to, you know, really toward a weak party system. So a weak party system is one where candidates rely more on themselves, on the media, on interest groups, on political action committees that we'll talk about down the road, um, but they're, 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 they're basically the fundraising arm of an interest group to help raise money for candidates and, 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 for, and for policy positions. 
Um, but a weak party system is where the candidates rely more on themselves, the media, and interest groups and PACs to get elected, and they rely less on the party apparatus to get elected. All right? And again, parties also under a weak party system play less of a role in influencing the average citizen. Now again, for many years our party system was strong. That went hand in hand with the rise of the political machine and the party bosses. Uh, and again, the progressives were pretty successful in destroying the power of these political machines and by instituting very important reforms. Uh, the use of primaries, the secret ballot, strict voter re registration laws, the merit system we've talked about before as well. But in breaking up the power of the machines, interestingly, the progressives also actually ended up weakening in many ways the power of political parties in our, in our country. Um, are there benefits to a weak party versus a strong party? Absolutely. There's benefits and, and disadvantages to both. Let me give you some benefits of a strong party system. A strong party system, if you have one, helps to bind uh, regional factions together. When you have different um, regions that have different, different viewpoints and different groups uh, advocating for different things, a strong party system helps pull them all together much more under the same party umbrella. All right? And a strong party system, again, provides a nice shortcut for citizens so that they know exactly sort of where the parties stand on, on certain issues. And a strong party system is also very good because it helps to prevent, prevent something called gridlock um, that can take place between the executive and the legislature. Okay, for, let me give you an example of gridlock. Gridlock often occurs when, and often uh, is, is when the president is uh, constantly vetoing legislation that comes out of Congress. Uh, that's gridlock because nothing is getting done. George H.W. Bush was often known as the gridlock president because he's often had to contend with a democratically controlled majority in Congress and they would, the Congress would pass legislation that he would disagree with and he would therefore veto it and during a lot of that period of time our nation and our law, you know, our, our institutions, the presidency and the Congress at that point in time were characterized by this idea of gridlock. Nothing was getting done. Well, how does a strong party system overcome gridlock? Well, if nothing else, in, 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 let's say you have this. You have a, a, say, a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress, like under Jimmy Carter. Uh, still, sometimes things don't get done because Jimmy Carter may disagree with the Democrats in Congress or vice versa. The Democrats in Congress disagree with, with what the president wants. And still, de grid, uh, gridlock can take place. Well, under a strong party system, there's less of that tendency. They're more along marching the lines with the way the party leadership wants to, wants to be. If you are, for example, here in, in America uh, and you get elected to the House of Representatives, you are much more beholden to your constituents than you are party leadership. Under a strong party system, you're going to be much more follow the party line, follow the party leadership, and vote according to the way the party leadership wants you to vote. And therefore, you're, the, whatever the party leadership proposes is going to get voted on by all members of that party in the legislature. Under a weak party system, you've got less of that because, again, you've got a lot of candidates who see themselves as sort of independent of the party. They are members of the party, but again, they're more beholden to what their constituents want. So even top leadership may want you to vote a certain way, you may choose to vote a different way because your constituents want you to vote a different way. You're less beholden to members of the party leadership, you're much more beholden to uh, your, your own constituents. So again, that has a tendency to, to, to mean that a democratic proposal in Congress doesn't get out of Congress because, it, because there are many people who are not all voting for that proposal or a Republican proposal doesn't get out of Congress because the Republican members are not voting according to the Republican leadership. So you see, even, even within the Congress, it may be dominated by a given party, but maybe something doesn't get done because the members are not acting with, quote, party discipline. They see themselves as independent mavericks who are more beholden to their constituents. All right, so the point here, under a strong party system, the legislators are going to act more in accordance with the wishes and the desires of the party leadership to get things done. So party, the decline of parties, a weak party, means the opposite of these things. All right. Also, another point um, that is important to talk about is the idea of campaigns. Under a strong party system, that was characterized what was called a party-centered campaign, where the party plays a lot of shots in helping a candidate get elected. But today, really, more campaigns are characterized by no, something known as candidate 
centered campaigns. And that's where the candidate relies increasingly more and more on you know, the people he or she hires to like, the consultants, the, 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 the media consultants, the polling consultants to see how they're doing in the polls, uh, the, the, the speech writers. In other words, uh, the, the close advisors that the, that the candidate will basically hire to help run the campaign. Instead of the party helping to run the campaign, these consultants are helping to run the campaign. So that's the idea of a candidate-centered campaign. They're relying more upon the media, relying more upon the consultants, and less upon the party overall to help coordinate and help guarantee a successful election outcome. So key indicators of a weak party system then goes hand in hand with these kinds of ideas. One indicator of a weak party system then naturally is the rise of the independent voter where those who identify strongly with neither party. All right, so that's a good indicator of a weak party system. Uh, talking about the role of the media and television. Television, not parties, play one of the most important roles in determining important political and election issues. It's the media, that, and, and you're going to be directly interfacing with the media and not, again, through worrying about the party. Um, so the role of the media, the role of particular of television, playing a dominant role in our, in our system. Um, the increase in split ticket voting, again, is an indicator of a weak party system because more and more people are voting. That independent voter is voting on the one hand for some races, voting for the Republican candidate, and other races voting for the Democratic candidate, even within the same election that they're participating in. Before the advent of TV, candidates had to rely more and more on the support of the party to get their message across and to mobilize voters on their behalf, much less so now in a weak party system. And like I said, today candidates rely more on their pollsters, their media consultants, uh, rather than county and state party activists to help mobilize voters. And that's again an important point. The state and local parties are not playing the major role in your campaign, but rather the political consultant that you hire. All right. Um, so those are some key indicators of a weak party party system. Now. This pretty much actually takes care uh, and uh, of the material that we want to uh, discuss here with political parties. Uh, what we're going to be doing in next time is moving into campaigns and elections. And it's a little bit of a complicated uh, set of topic and, and, and set of materials we'll be, we'll be covering. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, for example, campaign finance and where campaign finance laws stand today. We'll talk about the nature of elections and again how they've changed over time as well. Um, but before we even, even do that, let me just sort of, even sort of give you a hint of, of some of this and that, that I'll, I'm going to reinforce in our next discussion. But when we're talking about parties and party leadership and those kinds of things, uh, we're going to be talking about different kinds of elections, primary elections and general elections. And one of the things that we're going to see, for example, is, is when you think about primaries um, and the importance of primaries as a means for, for nominate, as a nominating process to become leader of your party. Um, one of the interesting things about the fact that we use a primary system is that people who, you need to think about people who vote in primaries versus the general election. And what we'll be talking about is the, how the nature of the voter in the primary system guarantees that the person who wins the primaries may not necessarily win the general election. You can do well in the primaries to get your party's nomination but end up being doing disastrously at the general election because of the nature of, of the kind of voter who shows up and votes in the primary elections. And a lot of those lines will be talking about how you're trying to, on the one hand in the primaries, appealing to the, your, your true believers, the people who are going to come out and support you, but at the same time not appeal too much to them because it actually may hurt you in the general election. So this wraps up our discussion of political parties. Until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you.